everyone. It's a genuine pleasure to share with you some further reflections on a topic that holds much relevance for us all, the future of work. And in a world where the average person spends over 100,000 hours working, where more than 80% of adults deeply identify with their job roles, and where employment still far too often creates significant unhappiness, the imperative is clear. We must ensure that work becomes a positive force for as many people as possible. And we firmly believe that requires leadership. Leaders across the board need to not only deepen their understanding of what constitutes good work and actively contribute to its realization, but they must also scrutinize their own role within organizational systems and assess their own capacity for transformative change, both personally and institutionally. And seizing the opportunity of the recent Global HR Congress, we turned the spotlight on a pivotal group of leaders, those in HR. And why HR? Well, simply because more than any other leaders, perhaps, HR should be the custodians of good work. After all, HR is all about people, isn't it? But here's the twist. When Antoinette and I prepared for the Congress and delved into the data, to be perfectly honest, we didn't quite see that. So if even HR is failing to deliver good work, what does this mean for the rest of us and what can we learn from it? Hence, we decided to kick off the HR Congress with a general provocation. We suggested that the future of work is looking increasingly bleak because leaders, and particularly those in HR, find themselves increasingly stuck. But let us start from the beginning. Over recent years, we have witnessed an explosion of new roles proposed for HR. And it's remarkable. We're truly world-class at inventing new positions. Can you spot some outlandish ones? And did you know four out of the top five new job roles on the rise in 2023 belong to HR? The lone outlier? The truck driver. Hmm. And yet, despite this feverish creativity, genuine transformation seems to be extremely rare. So our hypothesis is that all this variety masks a deep and unexplored identity crisis. We suspect that as a function, HR has willingly surrendered to the bottom line, and today we will try to show you why. But who are we to make such bold claims? And why should you listen to us over the myriad others promising you a human resource paradise? Well, firstly, because we're not here to sell you anything. And secondly, because we truly care about leadership and HR, but most importantly, because both Antoinette and I have spent the bulk of our careers trying to figure out how to craft better organizations. And you'll find our credentials on the slide, but in a nutshell today, Antoinette will take up her role as an HR expert, while I'll be seeking to draw from my experience in transformation and leadership. So together over the next 20, next 20 minutes, we aim to do two things. Firstly, we want to share with you a short retrospective of HR across its history. In an era where the noise of social media tends to crowd out critical analysis, we want to dig just that little bit deeper. In the second part, we want to explore how HR can free itself from what we will suggest is a deliberate stagnation. We firmly believe it is possible to change, but there are no simple fixes. Change demands substantial investment, determination, and above all, the willingness to face ourselves. It will need courageous people, like I am certain all of you who are watching are. So are you ready to embark on this little journey together? Wonderful. Let's start off with a simple but very important question. If you are an HR leader watching, why did you venture into HR? And if you think back to that very first day on that very first job, what made you step into the wonderful world of human resources? Ready? Let's give it a few seconds whilst you think. And now hold that thought. Why did you come into the world of leadership or HR? And uh, let's look at some research. Well, certainly, let's refine it a bit. 
Indeed, our research shows many reasons why individuals join HR. However, three motivations consistently stand out. A passion for working with people, a commitment to defending workers' rights, and a pragmatic drive to seek viable solutions when workplace conflicts arise. So, do any of these reasons resonate with your own thoughts? Let's assume they did, or at least to some extent. Then here comes the pivotal question. Considering these goals, how successful do you reckon HR has been? On a scale of 10, what's your personal score for HR accomplishing its mission? Let's say one, if we totally missed the mark, five for some moderate success, and 10 for a total triumph. What's your vote? Three, two, one, go. And while you're holding your personal score, Antoinette, what does the, what does the, does the research suggest? Well, the answer here is complicated. A lot of it depends, as we will hear in a second, on circumstances. However, across all the surveys we've looked at, three points crucially stand out. Firstly, HR, sadly, has become the least trusted function in the organization, except maybe among executives, but then they are not at all convinced that HR contributes significantly to the bottom line. Secondly, in many cases, HR is perceived as ineffective in addressing organizational tensions, let alone deliver reliable services. And many wouldn't even recognize us at the water cooler. And lastly, when it comes to employee welfare, the reality is disheartening. Most workers have been losing out. So to put it into scientific slang, on average, we did not fare very well. To put it into scientific slang, we did not fare very well on average. Now, that is puzzling, isn't it? Because we all claim to cherish people and I guess we're all fully energized around this future of work topic, but the perception of HR is quite the opposite. What's behind that disconnect? Indeed, that's the million dollar question. And we first went through a lot of popular HR literature and there we found one resounding message. It wasn't us. HR is innocent, we swear. It's the line managers who give us a hard time. It's the vendors who can't run the system. It's the workers who lack a growth mindset. And don't even get us started on those Gen Z folks who just don't want to work. Change is impossible because everybody around us is standing still. But you know, that explanation seemed a tad too easy. So we took out our shovels and dug a little bit deeper. So without burying you with lots of data, we suggest HR has essentially navigated four distinct phases across the last century. Firstly, paternalism. At the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, HR emerged to support early industrialists and family patriarchs striving for better health and living conditions in their factories. Then, secondly, power. Amid deteriorating work conditions and growing unions, HR pivoted to manage industrial power relations, ensuring orderly production. Thirdly, process. Post-World War II, HR expanded rapidly to facilitate ever larger scale of business with professional selection, training and management. And shortly afterwards, when social democracies demanded greater worker protection, the human relation movements emerged, seeking to balance performance and well-being. And finally, Profit, of course profit. When neoliberalism and global corporate expansion surged in the 80s, HR enthusiastically embraced high performance cultures and profit narrative. So by and large, it seems HR has readily conformed itself with all the trends in the evolution of modern capitalism. Starting undoubtedly with a strong focus on humanistic values, it gradually drifted with the currents towards ever greater instrumentalization. And that's a paradox, isn't it? We've all learned that culture change is rooted in those underlying assumptions and values below the surface. So if HR had strongly humanistic values, how did it drift off course? How did it drift off course? And unfortunately, it turns out the fashionable iceberg model is as popular as it is simplistic. So it's time to upgrade our toolkit. Out with shine and in comes complexity. And now, again, without diving deep into the details, you'll find all the references on our website. Let me share a point from the operational cold phase. As it happens in complex business environments, when we dive beneath that surface, we very, very seldom find a neatly ordered set of shared values and assumptions that we can plug into some regression analysis or bake into some culture change program to create the future. Conversely, the waters often 
pretty dark and murky, and we face dangerous sharks and treacherous currents. Or in more technical speak, within complex social systems, we encounter three essential entities, people, culture, and social structures, and each with their unique powers. And the combined interactions generate complex mechanisms that might translate into certain constellations that eventually we might detect above the waterline. So it's all a little bit more complex, but what does this mean for HR? Well, very simply put, it means that we cannot just pick and choose our roles in complex social systems. There is no action without context. And often roles predate us and our character and identity emerge dynamically from the interplay between dominant narratives, our own evolving agency and relational dynamics. And this also implies that this highly popular idea that we can simply change culture by changing mindsets is utterly simplistic. It takes indeed the evolution of all these different elements in the system in order to generate sustainable transformation. Plus, speaking from some experience, it sometimes takes a lot of courage to fend off those lurking sharks of orthodoxy and tradition. So maybe you could say that HR was indeed a victim of circumstances. Because right from its inception, HR occupied what is called a marginal leadership position. That's a nice way for saying that despite our relentless proclamation that people are at the heart of our business, HR had in fact very little power. Its profession was loose, its authorization uncertain, and its influence limited, sparking existential anxiety and a deep desire to carve out a role that was both recognized and effective. Initially, that wasn't a big issue until the context shifted towards massive instrumentalization, because then HR got trapped by those powerful currents below the surface. In order to wield influence within the business, HR basically had to justify its existence by instrumentalizing itself. And that's when the idea of the business partner discourse was born, which seemed a truly brilliant idea at the time. And all research shows ex HR's extraordinary efforts to ascend to strategic significance over the past three decades. But truth to be told, it always was, in essence, a dangerous game of swimming with the sharks. And unfortunately, HR heroically failed. In fact, instead of getting closer to the people, HR found itself disconnected from the very individuals it aimed to serve. The very imprudent separation between that strategic advice and day-to-day -day people operations led to HR management by remote control and algorithm, a booming, an absolutely booming HR outsourcing market and increasing depersonalization. And that's why HR often goes unrecognized in those organizational corridors. And of course, vendors absolutely loved it. It's no coincidence that 90% of HR research today is sponsored by suppliers. And instead of championing labor rights, HR often operated as a subsidiary of the finance department. That original humanism faded away very, very quickly when the emphasis shifted towards numbers and KPIs and performance-based pay and the relentless construction of business cases to support human capitalism. And finally, HR inadvertently undermined its own capacity to tackle real world issues because that free tier model, anyone, and the excessive outsourcing, but also its single-minded reliance on rolling out systems gradually chipped away at HR's core competencies and flexibility, eroding both its unique knowledge and its capacity to customize its services. And it also lost some valuable allies. So let's keep on asking ourselves, whenever we read about new leadership recipes in and beyond HR, are we prioritizing humanism or is instrumentalism calling the shots? But of course, you might counter, hold on a second, that's too pessimistic. What about COVID? Didn't the whole world embrace human-centric values, purpose-led organizations and a global drive for planetary well-being? Well, that's true, or better, that's truly what people claimed, because unfortunately, it was not what they did. Sure, a few solar panels went up on head offices, chief purpose officers were appointed, and CEO bonuses were tied to rather meaningless ESG targets. Lots of business became excellent in green, white or blue washing and we created a $1.5 trillion well-being market, mostly selling quick fixes. But substantive change was stunningly absent across the board. 
And as for HR, that initial revival of humanism was swiftly overshadowed by a focus on the technicalities of remote working processes and agility and performance. Once the COVID tech bubbles subsided and vendors stopped celebrating, we saw thousands of layoffs to catapult stock markets to all-time high. And we? We continue to endorse and even accelerate a plethora of toxic practices that are neither ethically nor scientifically sound. And this really is not to discount the genuine efforts of numerous organizations, particularly smaller ones, and of wonderful colleagues who every single day seek to make a positive difference. Rather, it's an urgent recognition that our businesses still too often cause human suffering and squander human potential. We believe HR has not yet faced that critical self-reflection necessary to keep those sharks at bay. This is, by the way, what Mats Alvesen calls functional stupidity. Lots of highly intelligent people end up doing remarkably foolish things. And let's be honest, unless we shift, the future of work will only amplify the troubles for our people and HR might quickly become obsolete. Which brings us to the second and hopefully brighter part of our short journey. What can we do? Where do we lead from here? How can we get to a new horizon for work to borrow from the conference theme of the HR Congress where, quote unquote, the well-being of individuals and the nurturing of humane workplaces has taken center stage. Is it even possible? Well, yes, we think it is, but it's not gonna be easy. And our first step has to be to gain clarity on where exactly we want to lead our organizations, not what is the future of work, which is descriptive, but what should the work of the future be? And there are so many ideas and proposals and leadership models scattered all around cyber, cyberspace that it has really become hard to know what to believe in. And that's exactly why two years ago, Antoinette and I embarked on an inquiry to figure out what exactly makes organizations good. And one thing became immediately evident, most of what's being proposed as new today remains entrenched in an instrumentalist paradigm. Concepts like agility and net zero, net positive, sustainability, ESG, SDG, you name it, center around doing less harm while essentially maintaining the status quo. And if we are not very careful, the future of work narrative it itself becomes instrumental by emphasizing the necessity for people to submit themselves to an inescapable set of external changes without questioning where we're going and why. But reducing bureaucracy or becoming more agile or offsetting CO2 emissions certainly isn't the same as doing good, because doing good is about who we are and how to bring to life the best in ourselves at and through work. So our idea is that we need to re-embed our organizations as the vital link between a fulfilling life and a prosperous society. Organizations obtain excellence by firstly enabling people to develop internally and secondly by contributing collectively to a good economy and society externally. And let's be clear, we are not arguing against making organizations more efficient, customer-centric or adaptive, but we do suggest to do it for a different purpose. Profit is not an end in itself, but must serve to enable social flourishing and justice on a larger scale. But that clearly takes more than new narratives or polished purpose statements. Firstly, as we have seen, we must cultivate all those elements below the organizational surface, from the underlying cultural foundations like language, symbols, metrics and policies, to the structural frameworks, routines and systems. And of course, also to the holistic development of individuals and communities. And this calls for a new model to look at organizations. In our, own, in our own work, we emphasize the intentional development of virtuous social practices, which we have called micro-organizations, alongside the refinement of corporate institutions and governance, which we frame as the corporation, and of course, people. And here our focus lies not just on competencies, but character, virtues, and wisdom. But it's not just about each component, but also about the connection between them, because truly human centric organizations need to nurture a moral environment that combines care and integrity and compassion with a genuine commitment towards mutual elevation for the greater good. And to do so, we must continue to evolve organizational design and 
seeking to strike a more progressive balance between local affordances within those microorganizations, the individual growth, and the need to foster shared learning and a coherent external value proposition. And that's quite difficult. In our research, we can clearly see that with growing scale, most corporations turn instrumentalist. And to counter this, we believe that we must overlay the existing dominant financial governance with disciplines for collective reflection and participation, essentially creating what could be called a living organizational constitution. For instance, at ING, HR sponsored a so-called leadership council that collectively steered the ongoing global transformation. And the ultimate goal here is to first connect people's structures and cultures, thus nurturing organizational wisdom, identity, and character, and then to enable something like a reflective equilibrium that continually actualizes the potential of the organization within the context that it finds to create that social flourishing. Or to put it more simply, we must learn to care and be intentional about our organization's moral climate, exactly like we have learned to care for the environmental climate. But how does all of this translate into action? Firstly, we must focus more on our people. This involves character-based selection and promotion, personalized development plans, and strict adherence to that famous no asshole rule. Secondly, we need much more deliberately evolved management structure and practices to craft that reflective holding space for mutual growth and creativity. And thirdly, we must revise corporate governance structures and institutions like success measures, reward and recognition policies or team affordances to embed virtuous principles and actively develop and foster positive impact. The key here is to evolve people and organizational practices holistically across various levels, avoiding fragmentation between specializations or vendors. But, and there's always a but, from our experience, the maturity of an organization, we call that transformation rule number one, can never transcend the wisdom of its leaders. And therefore, we must also deliberately develop leadership. And there's a lot to do. A recent study by the CMI, the Chartered Management Institute, found that 52% of leaders, leaders lack basic professional qualifications and 50% of new leaders fail within the very first year. So I think there can be no doubt that HR is in a great position to foster positive transformation. It holds many critical levers to influence the context, both within HR, but also across the policies and structures and success measures of the broader organization. And we've gathered some uh, initial ideas. You can see it on the slide and you will find more ideas and more details on our website. But we would really love to hear from you. If you're willing to share your thoughts, your best practices, the exemplars you've found, and maybe also the challenges you've encountered, just get in touch because we will try to combine it all and make it available for everybody at our website, leadershipsociety.world. But talking about the need for better leadership, this of course brings us back to our initial question. HR possesses some power, but it might be unwilling or unable to wield it effectively. So which of those many, 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 many roles should HR assume to catalyze positive change? Well, in essence, we believe it all boils down to only three viable options. The first one, A, stick to that conventional business partner narrative. And this frankly encompasses all those fashionable trends from AI to DEI. Secondly, B, cultivate HR's role as what we've called an excellence broker. And this could mean, for example, empowering and uniting selected good leaders within an organization to systematically create ripple effects throughout the business. And it demands more focus on learning and development and change management and a radical empowerment of virtuous teams. And maybe you can think, it, think about it a little bit like an undercover mission aimed at selectively eliminating barriers to excellence from the bottom up, one team at a time, until the whole system shifts. And lastly, where feasible, HR could step up its position in the boardroom to actively steer the organization towards a new and more humanistic narrative. And this would require a human-centric overhaul of all HR policies and processes, the intentional development of governance and organizational design, and frankly, a meticulous vetting process for all leaders. Now, here's the thing. If we all choose option A, we might as well wrap it up now, because we'd be anchoring HR's future exactly where we stand today. 
We can discuss well-being, the and why, analytics and talent management until the cows come home, but little will change. So why don't we do a quick poll? Whom do you aim to serve with your leadership in the coming years? Employees, shareholders, the greater good, or all of them? And what risks are you ready to face? Three choices, partner, broker, or leader. Are you ready for a vote? Are you firmly committed to the business partner model and intend to remain there? Or are you willing to up your game, actively promoting the right people and structures? Or finally, are you daring to dive straight into the boardroom to lead from the front? Let's hope so. It's quite intriguing, isn't it? But perhaps that wasn't the right question after all. Maybe the real challenge is how, how we together can create the conditions for a systematic shift in the role of HR and leadership in general across as many organizations as possible. And this won't be easy because marginal leaders must always reckon with deeply instrumental organizational immune systems. And this leads us straight to the end of our little journey and our call to action. It is our firm belief that the time is ripe for a better future of work. The urgency of climate change has rattled our conscience. New narratives are fast emerging everywhere, challenging the status quo. And increasingly, I find that leaders are willing to step up. But in order to succeed, HR practitioners require more than just moral courage. They need to acquire the competence, the determination, and wisdom to lead against the odds. And they must collaborate to develop those new HR practices to cultivate good organizations. But I think above all, they must feel supported by their peers in asking the important and often very inconvenient questions, whilst proudly upholding a spirit of humanity and maintaining that dual loyalty, both to the organization and to their profession. And that's why we believe we must invest heavily in HR as a profession. Every senior leader in HR should make it a strong commitment to maintain a prof professional mandate. But as we said at the beginning, the challenge clearly extends far beyond the example of HR. If we are all serious about achieving good work, we need all senior leaders to step up. And this is why we have inaugurated a new initiative aimed at professionalizing leadership called the Global Society for Good Leadership. It is meant to be an active collaboration between academia and practice to combine the best of research with the best of our collective experience. Our objective is to stimulate a humanistic ethos of good leadership and to systematically support all those marginal leaders across functions with continual development, a strong community, and our collective best practices. And such a project cannot succeed without the partnership and courage of executives at all levels. We must insist together on the advancement of better leadership within and across the organization, because let's face it, the challenges that society encounters today cannot be resolved by any single company alone. But perhaps by forging a broader coalition of leaders committed to the highest potential of both people and organizations, we stand a tiny chance to foster the necessary shift in the character of business to defy an increasingly dehumanized financial capitalism that encroaches upon our enterprises. And the simple truth is, excellence in business is not just about what we produce and certainly not simply about how much money we make but ultimately about who we become. Our work is always also a mirror image of who we are, capable of creating boundless joy or bottomless sorrow. Therefore, colleagues and friends, what you do and how you develop your own leadership in your own organization and beyond matters. And with that, we come to the end. The presentation references and resources are available on our website at leadershipsociety.world. And if you want to take away one closing thought from our session, remember, we are not good leaders because we rule. We are good leaders because we truly care. The future of work, it's already here. Let's not waste it. Thank you very much. Thank you.